Star 7 will unmute if you wish to share your voice with the call. We are recording this call, and screen sharing is available in the link at line 76. Uh, there's also some really useful information starting at line 80, blog posts, press, and weekly updates for those that love the background info. And let me draw your attention to line 99. We are very lucky to have a guest speaker this week, Mozilla community member Lyrae Calliope. Uh, she wants to talk about Mozilla as an open media organization. Lily, welcome, and uh, take it away. All right. Uh, first of all, I am very much a he. Uh, wasn't my choice. My parents. Oh, my my apologies. <laughs> uh, no problem. I actually uh, play a female in Second Life, uh, so it's it's very much a confusing matter all around. Um, yeah. So uh, for the past few weeks, I have been writing a series of blog posts. Uh, titled Mozilla as a Media Organization, where I have been exploring the idea of Mozilla uh, turning into a global media empire. It's, it's kind of my uh, bigger picture vision of what uh, Mozilla uh, could become, um, just following natural tra trajectories with WebMaker as well as Mozilla Marketplace. And uh, most importantly, what I think Mozilla needs to become in order to accomplish its mission. Um, so I've, I've actually been rather inspired by all, all the work that's been done by uh, Philip Smith uh, with regard to the um, uh, Mozilla uh, Knight Foundation partnership and um, just this uh, forward thinking with regard to the future of news media. And uh, really interested in this dialogue about the future of Planet Mozilla, and um, back and forth between Philip and Matt about you know well what do we do about this fire hose of information that's you know constantly growing and inundating us with too much awesome. Um, it's it's a, it's a serious problem because there's uh, just you know, limited bandwidth to go around, and Mozilla is a growing organization with so much going on, how do, how do you make sure that everyone has the information they need so that we can align effectively as an organization? So uh, the, I, I see the problem with uh, Planet Mozilla as not only an opportunity to start building towards becoming a uh, media empire, but also a, an opportunity to start uh, doing some internal storytelling, as well as um, you know, aligning our communications practices um, internally. Uh, so rather than talking about sort of my bigger picture vision, I'd actually like to uh, sort of explore this idea of Planet Mozilla as a, uh, a media brand, a news brand. Uh, so the problem with Planet Mozilla isn't unique to Mozilla. It's actually a problem with the web. Uh, there's too much information. Uh, there's uh, you know communications problems galore because we're all in need with all this content, and our attention is scarce. Um, and this this isn't just you know with with regard to news media. This is just data in general. We are entering the big data era, and how do we filter it all and find meaning as the media the, the data exponentially increases? Uh, and that I think we should really be exploring of a planet Mozilla from is, is this idea of uh, not just you know creating a a, uh, a blog in a news brand, but eventually working towards creating a full blown um, media channel uh, out of Planet Mozilla, in which we have you know internal edit editorializing, we have external journalists coming in. With guest spots, we have, you know, video taking over cable TV, uh, Mozilla plushies, the full nine yards. Um, and I, I think the uh, all the topics on uh, WebMaker call really is an opportunity on the table. We have news about the Open News Fellowship. Um, we have the uh, Data Journalism Handbook that's really important to this dialogue. Then we have Popcorn Maker, which uh, in my mind is uh, you know, even more disruptive than YouTube ever could be. You know, YouTube was always about, you know, democratizing the distribution and consumption of video. Popcorn Maker is all about what is video in the first place. Um, you know, uh, so when, when it comes to 
creating a media channel, Planet Mozilla isn't just, you know, uh, the opportunity space isn't just creating another news channel. It's really about redefining news and doing it within Mozilla. And uh, we have the partnerships. We have the, uh, we have the knowledge. We have the information. It's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, coming up with a vision, coming up with a plan, and taking over the media world. And um, Philip has uh, just wrote a post uh, talking about some uh, ways we can bootstrap that. And I'm definitely interested in continuing this conversation about uh, exactly what are the next steps and uh, what, what can we work towards. Um, one thing I'd like to point out from my, my blog post uh, is this diagram of Mozilla channels, uh, just kind of looking at where all, all the different dialogues are going on across Mozilla and all the different uh, brands that are being cut, like Mozilla Drumbeat. Um, it seems to me that Mozilla is um, uh, converging upon maybe six separate channels. Uh, Planet Mozilla would be one, and Mozilla Webmaker would be another. Um, whereas Planet Mozilla is focused on internal-ish communications, it's for Mozillans, about Mozillans. Uh, you know, Mozilla Webmaker is is really all about the world at large. You know, what are people within the world, uh, you know, making with the web? You know, it's it, it's all about empowerment of individuals worldwide, and Whatever infrastructure we build uh, uh, toward becoming a media empire, toward becoming a, a, a cutting edge hypermedia newsroom in part of Mozilla, uh, in the long term, I'd like to uh, recommend that this infrastructure that we build actually be applied to a multi-channel strategy. So moving forward, what are the channels that exist within Mozilla, and how can we apply cutting edge journalism practices to each of these channels and uh, you know sh share infrastructure accordingly um, and then you know kind of in the short term uh, you know in the next couple you know days weeks and months uh, what kind of stories do we want to tell what's what what information uh, do we want to share with each other and how do you want to share it? what is what, what are the core media products that we want to have? Um, I, I think uh, uh, Philip has a big proposal for next steps, uh, sort of changing uh, Planet Mozilla from a news feed to a blog um, type format. Uh, perhaps we could add video to that in the short term. Uh, but beyond that, do, do we want to have you know, other media products uh, such as, you know, uh, a quarterly uh, sort of e-newspaper e or something, or, uh, you know, a, a weekly talk show, things of that nature. What, what would be valuable media uh, to create within Planet Mozilla uh, to get everyone on the same page? And not just that, but, you know, tell the human story and feel like we're a part of something bigger. Those are super excellent questions. Shall we open up the floor and invite folks to give feedback or raise questions of their own? I would love that. Who's got a question, either in the IRC or coming off mute and telling us what you're thinking? Hey, Lou, the, the first question in line 150 is, um, you know, is media empire something that Mozilla really wants to become? So maybe, maybe you could say a bit more about um, what you mean by Mozilla as a media organization or a <laughs> media empire. All right. So uh, when I say media empire, I'm I'm kind of sort of putting up my peacock feathers and sort of being sort of, sort of a, a bit alpha there. Um, the uh, this kind of uh, goes back to, uh, back when I was doing sort of social media consulting or whatever they're calling it nowadays. Um, just the idea that social media forces all organizations to become media organizations of one form or another. Uh, you know, we, we become our own news outlets. Um, right now, we have a situation in which the center of the media world is no longer, you know, video, TV, cable. It's really uh, between YouTube, Facebook, and we 
even those either. It's, it's really about our mobile devices. It's about iOS and Android. That's the center of our, our media world. It's all about you know the app stores being the primary point of interaction of media channels and people. And the uh, Mozilla market that's for Mozilla marketplace that's forthcoming is an opportunity for Mozilla to democratize that uh, so that we're not all beholden to, you know, uh, essentially Apple and Google. Um, and when I say that um, Mozilla should become a media empire, what I mean is that Mozilla should set the template for uh, what it means to be uh, uh, an organization that utilizes the web effectively towards, you know, uh, being, you know, uh, an experiential powerhouse, you know, uh, accessible in, in accessible around us, the the objects around us, as the Internet of Things comes into play, um, you know, as as a way to not only uh, mediate but uh, bolster relationships between uh, people and ideas. Right on. Thank you. Um, the next question I see, are we agnostic in our media reportage or do we have an agenda? Do you have a take on sort of what, what editorial bias might be extant in this media infrastructure? Um, I, I, I think that uh, I, I'm biased in the sense that I think all media has a bias. But um, I, I think Planet Mozilla in particular is a very specifically biased towards creating um, Mozillian uh, Kool Aid, essentially. I mean, it's 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 you know beautiful to the outside, but it's really it's, it's really for us. You know, it's really for us to not only uh, feel awesome, be awesome, but uh, it's really for us to get on the same page and be an effective organization. So, uh, whatever stories need to be told uh, in order to make that happen, that's where our editorial slant is. As for the other channels, I have no opinion on those yet. Right on. Thank you. So I see some other questions. What's the minimum viable prototype? How can we break off a small bit quickly? This seems like a tough bit. Any thoughts on sort of yeah. a first pilot or iteration? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, Philip uh, just uh, actually uh, proposed the first iteration on uh, his blog. I think it was last night. Um, if, if you uh, scroll up, I think it's on line 128. So yeah, line 128 is my answer. Right on. And that would be? Uh, that, that was essentially starting off with uh, rebranding Planet Mozilla blog, and then having uh, the current uh, uh, RSS aggregator essentially be uh, rebranded as kind of a tool of Planet Mozilla. Got it. So, and uh, do you uh, agree or disagree that the first step would be hiring a human editor or filter or journalist or storyteller? Uh, I, I think that would definitely be a very good first step. Right on. And the last question I'm seeing here: How do you see this tying into the Monday Mozilla All Hands meeting? Um, as per the idea of a weekly participatory talk show? Ooh, that's a very good question. Maybe I should chime in on one of those meetings. I have no right idea. On. Very cool. Well, we are coming up on the end of our time slot. Anybody want to ask a last question? I'm not seeing anything in the IRC. Seeing some great notes being taken in the Etherpad. Larry, any final sentence or two kind of uh, to summarize what we should take away and be reflecting on? Uh, no, I, I think I've uh, pretty much put it all out there. Um, no, actually, I think I'm good. Awesome. Well, we thank you so much for bringing these great ideas to the call, and we'll look forward to seeing where this goes. And please don't be shy about keeping us posted and letting us know how folks on this call can help. All right. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And then we'll invite you to go back to Star 7 Mute Land, and then <coughs> We have Apply to Become a Knight Mozilla News Fellow. Could it be Dan Sinker who's giving us these next three quality minutes, or someone Dan has delegated? It is, in fact, Dan Sinker. And am I audible? 
Hey, man. I am. Excellent. So, yeah, we uh, officially opened the window to apply to become a Knight Mozilla Fellow in the 2012-2013 um, round last week. You can see there's a whole uh, host of links there on the um, – uh, did I say last week? I meant yesterday. Um, <laughs> there's a whole host of links uh, there on the Etherpad right now. Um, in addition, so the application window um, is open from yesterday until August 11th. There'll be four months uh, for applications. Um, there is a application process this year. Last year, um, there was uh, there was kind of a, a series of, of tasks and challenges. Uh, this year, we've simplified the process by uh, going with a, a straightforward application. Um, a lot of actually uh, the motivation behind that is borrowed from both the Night News Challenge this year, which which super simplified their process, and uh, Code for America, which has had a pretty nice straightforward application um, from the get-go. So it's uh, it asks five questions, 450 words. It asks uh, for some links to repos and projects that people have done, uh, and then uh, we will evaluate from there. Um, in addition, time to correspond with the uh, application opening. The fully fleshed out uh, Mozilla Open News uh, website is now uh, up and running. Uh, we had had a single page placeholder since the uh, project rename in, uh, in late February. Um, so we're pretty excited to have a full fledged uh, site up. And we were actually able to put together a little video uh, announcing the um, the application window opening as well. And I see on the notes and questions, uh, I think it's from Matt, it says, that explainer video was awesome. Can we make more of them for our other projects? Uh, maybe Dan and Chris Appleton can talk a little bit about the process behind it and how, can, how we can replicate and streamline. So yeah, um, I had originally uh, made just a pretty straightforward talking into a camera video um, and had it up as sort of a placeholder with the with the plan that I was going to reshoot it in a little bit better uh, fashion before we actually went live. Um, I forwarded uh, all the material off to Ryan and Matt and Mark, and uh, Ryan actually had an excellent suggestion of, hey, let's get Chris to uh, take this and uh, you know kind of make it a Lawrence Lessig style uh, slide based uh, slide based video. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so Chris, uh, Chris ran with it, and actually it worked out really, really well. Um, in terms of the process, one thing that I, I did was actually I had, uh, I had made a video, uh, but I had actually uh, recorded the audio separately from the video, so it was very easy to strip the audio out and have a really clean audio channel uh, to be able to, to give to Chris. Um, if Chris is on the line, he can maybe talk about how he approached uh, putting the video together a little bit. Uh, Chris here. Um, basically, had a really good uh, script and audio to work with from Dan, so that was all sort of ready to go from a, a content side of things. And basically, um, yeah, I just sort of went through, listened to it a bunch of times, tried to figure out like the, the key points to sort of pull out um, and just sort of emphasize the story that started being told. Um, so yeah, it, it was a pretty quick sort of turnaround just because it was uh, sort of a last minute thing, but I think yeah, it turned out pretty good with the audio and the text coming together, just nice sort of simple pairing, but um, yeah, pretty low tech, easy kind of thing to throw together, so if there's more kind of stuff like this, I think it's a nice opportunity to just kind of um, add a little bit to it if, if you don't want to just have a, a recording in front of the computer or something like that, it kind of comes together nicely. Yeah, and I would say when when I was working on the script, a key uh, a key thing to me was to keep it uh, at a minute and a half or under, so that it was actually going to be watched uh, from start to finish. Um, and uh, and I think the the final ended up at about a minute twenty, so that was uh, that was awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, next question down is our particular focus for the project this year. Uh, E.g., data visualization, data-driven journalism, cute, hed cute hedgehog photos. Um, that's a reflection, I think, of, of last year. There were a few different challenges that were themed uh, as the first stage in the fellowship selection process. Um, we have jettisoned that approach um, in part because as we scale up the number of news partners we work with, 
um, the types of things that they're going to want fellows to be working on is beginning to um, splinter and 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 turn into a much larger process. So it's hard to kind of whittle it down into uh, finite uh, challenges. The other thing was we wanted um, to be able to uh, divorce the application process from the kind of hacking and, and making um, that happened last year so that people can participate at the level that they want to participate and uh, also so that we don't kind of create the uh, early uh, <clears throat> the early mover funnel that existed last year where the only way to kind of get in on the fellowship was to engage in some of those making uh, uh, and design challenges early in the early in the spring, uh, even though the fellowship fellows weren't actually finalized until uh, October. So uh, we wanted to simplify the process, and part of that meant uh, removing some of that kind of themed uh, aspects to it. Awesome, Dan. Thank you so much. Anything that we could be doing to spread the word before we move on to our next agenda item? Spread the word. Send out the links. Send out the videos. Uh, you know, at at various things that are bringing developers in, push them towards the fellowships because they're going to be awesome this year. Thank you. Right everybody. on. Thank you, sir. All right. <clears throat> so, in a dramatic last-minute agenda change, we have moved the data journalism handbook item up in order to allow continuity of topical area. So, Liliana, with apologies, might we invite you to tell us about the data journalism handbook and where that's at since Mosfest? Star 7 to unmute. Paging Liliana to the front lobby. Okay, well why don't we assume that uh, Liliana is not quite yet in the house and move on down to Popcorn Maker 0 0.3. I need to understand what this mid-80s cinematic illusion is a la Breakfast Club. Popcorn Maker, who's got that story for us? Star 7 to unmute. Paging Popcorn Maker to the front lobby. Hello. How are you? Hey, hey. Good. Bring it on. Excellent. Um, so the um, Breakfast Club theme is actually the coming of age of uh, Popcorn Maker. So hopefully you'll be able to see that. Um, is there something special I have to do to share my screen? Just click Just share desktop. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Click share desktop. Yeah. Excellent. OK. Um, so we've been working pretty hard. Um, the uh, release is really come, coming together, um, and recently we've uh, been working on some things that have specifically to do with the online part of um, the Popcorn Maker experience. And so we've um, done a lot of work on getting you know, butter to work uh, the way we think it, it looks really nice, um, but also this uh, Popcorn Maker website presence here. So you can't really see the top because my screen is too giant, but that's okay. Um, I'm just going to click this Get Started button and show you what we've got. Um, so the Popcorn Maker's uh, website, um, you can go and uh, visit it by yourself if you want to, the link's in the Etherpad, but you'll basically see this. Um, and we have uh, five demo templates to show off. Um, and let's start maybe with uh, everybody's favorite, the pop-up. So I can just click on this pop-up button. And I can see that I get um, what you would normally expect from um, you know, the, the butter popcorn maker experience. Um, but we've been working really, really hard to make sure that this is um, a much uh, less flawed experience than we've seen in the past. And so uh, we have a lot of really nice features that are in here, um, and it just doesn't break as often, which is amazing. Um, but we've also added some really cool things. Um, you can, you know, I'm just going to um, add some stuff. Um, and pretend I'm actually authoring something inside of this uh, app. So that gives it some positioning. And that's great. And so um, I can see that the pop-up um, application here actually works. You can see that this thing actually did pop up, uh, which is great. But um, we've added the um, sort of the online presence, and we took a lot of notes from GitHub, um, and we decided to add a share button at the top. So you can sign in with browser ID now to um, our service. And you can save your content. So I'm just going to say, like, Bob's best presentation ever, and click Save. And then I can see my published work. 
So that means you can send someone this URL now, and they should be able to see the same thing that you saw when you were editing your, your thing. And you, as you can see, um, there is the lone event that I added in when we were um, editing that experience. So the whole thing uh, basically works from front to back now, and so you can actually author an environment and send someone to something that you've created and never have to really touch anything locally. Um, you just have to use the templates that we've provided. Um, and I just wanted to show off um, a, a little bit uh, something that um, Kate Hudson put together for us uh, to demo today, which is a music video template, which is very cool. Um, if you're a Mother Mother fan, you'll, you'll love it. Um, but you can basically see that um, we've, taken the, we've taken the approach that we can give you an experience um, that's a little bit catered for the kind of template that you've chosen. So uh, the events that are on the timeline are to demonstrate how you can use this template already. So you might say, um, click play here, and you can see what it does. Um, and the, the events that are on the timeline are um, happening in real time with this, this preview up top. And so uh, Kate has decorated the timeline with things that might already be useful to you, and that sort of um, beckon you to, to change what they are. So I can actually change this to something else and make it say, what an S. Click the done button. Sorry? Oh, yes, excellent. There you go. Hey, Bob. Yes. One of the other things that you should probably show off uh, that represents a ton of work and a ton of amazing, uh, it's a great new feature, is the fact that you can change the timeline media uh, dynamically, and we fully support um, YouTube now, which is, um, is going to be huge for the people that need to use this in like uh, workshop contexts, etc. That is an excellent point. And let me attempt that. Um, so I'm going to maybe go to this context uh, plug uh, template that we have, and I can very easily just open up this little box here and paste in the URL, which is a YouTube URL, and it happens to be a mother mother. And uh, there you go. It just kind of loads up, and I get the same experience you would expect from any other kind of video. So we sort of have a nice complete picture of video inside of um, Popcorn Maker now, and um, feel free to try it out. All the links should be in the Etherpad for you guys to, to explore. Awesome. Bobby, thank you. This is super, super impressive. Hey, Bobby, can I get you to show off a couple of other awesome features of it, too? Because I want to... Bobby has been uh, cranking on this for like a month, so may forget all the awesome that is in here. Um, one of the really cool, nice just usability features is that you can now drag um, you can now drag an event from your tray directly onto the page. So like as he's dragging that, you can see that it highlights the areas of the page where you can drop uh, popcorn. And then you can dynamically add that, and like the whole, air, you know, the whole tray that he's using there is like actually everything you're seeing now is a top to bottom rewrite of the popcorn maker that you know and love, but put up with <laughs> basically. But all these events, you know, like the whole timeline, the scroll bars, the tracks, uh, the ways that the tray is working, the ways that you add things, this is all rewritten, um, and, and you'll see for yourself to use it, that it's like way faster. So like it's, it's incredibly optimized. Um, so like just, just little things like that are huge. And then just the ability to write the templates as well. Maybe, Kate, you, if you want to talk to that a little bit, your experience authoring one yesterday. Like, as I understand it, this music video template was actually just made yesterday. And that, that was a whole part of this, was making authoring templates um, really easy. And that's going to definitely be part of you know, the workshopping that we do as well. So, so you want me to talk about making it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we've got to just, um, folks, we have about one more minute. So I'll just invite you to talk about that, but also leave room for any questions in that tiny 60 seconds. Well, I mean, all I want to say is that it's, it's super easy. You know, if you can do CSS and HTML, um, you can pretty much figure out how to make a template. So. It, it's certainly, uh, making a basic template is, is definitely doable in a short amount of time. 
great. Like falling off a keyboard? Sorry? I was being silly. I said like falling off a keyboard. Oh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Right yeah. on. I am looking here to see what other uh, questions we might have in the popcorn youth update. Um, popcorn youth update. Popcorn um, update. Um, this is looking fantastic. All right. Well, anybody have one question before we move on? Well, congratulations, folks. This is an incredible step forward. Super slicktastic. Can't wait to take it for a test drive, and can't wait to see wait to see the summer kitchen table jams that come out of this great platform. Hey, Gunnar. The oh, only right. last thing I would add is that um, we're still tweaking things, but we'll probably be posting out a link for folks to share uh, like sometime this week. So just stay tuned for that, and help us spread the word on that. It would be awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, Liliana, I wonder if Liliana has come back into the lobby for the Data Journalism Handbook. Liliana, if you're there, would you press star 7 to let us know that you are with us? All right. I'm going to assume Liliana is caught up in some other conference call at the time being. So let's move forward. Hey, um, open badges, public beta. How's that for four happy words? Aaron, can you give us a quick update on that? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, so we talked about this last week, and it was sort of like it's coming, and um, it has come. It is alive as well. So we launched um, a public beta version of the Open Badge infrastructure, um, I think officially on end of day on Friday or midday on Friday. Um, and we're doing the kind of big press announcement stuff today. There's a press release that's going to go out about um, 1 p.m. Eastern time. But, um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, as we've sort of talked about on this, these calls, the, the sort of experiment or exploration of badges as an alternative credentialing or accreditation system um, has a bunch of momentum, um, a lot of attention, and a lot of kind of big names, um, you know, putting some sort of time and effort into this. So, so there's lots of um, movement in the right direction, but the, the infrastructure is a critical piece to, to sort of seeing that success because it really allows us to move past kind of siloed systems into um, an ecosystem where um, learners really can, um, you know, sort of create their own pathways, earn badges as they go, and, um, and really get kind of legitimate and real results from, from lots of learning, uh, especially learning outside of the classroom, so informal, on-the-job, interest-driven types of learning. So, so, it's a, so releasing the public data um, is, is a kind of a, was a huge milestone in, in reaching um, sort of our visions of what badges could be. Um, and so the public beta, um, my blog post is there. It sort of outlines what, um, what's included in public beta, but the sort of shorthand version is that it's, it's, um, it's sort of the feature complete for, for what we need for, um, to support the ecosystem. So there's an issuer API that allows badges to be pushed in, and there's a displayer API that allows badges to be pulled out and displayed, and then there's the, re the centralized repositories for storing badges and managing badges in the middle um, called the backpack. So, all that exists, um, and um, in, in fact, you can go to Open Badges right now and openbadges.org, and you can earn your first badge, or actually two badges, create your own backpack, and start to see it working right now. Um, you can also go to our um, GitHub account to see the code and the documentation. Um, if you want to issue badges, you can issue badges as of right now, as of last Friday. Um, if you want to display badges, you can display them as of last Friday. So. So it's pretty exciting, and um, I gave kudos to the team last week, um, but kudos again, and also kudos to the community for really um, helping us along the way. Um, and in terms of, of what everybody can do, uh, there's a tweet there, and feel free to edit, but if people can kind of spread the word, um, that would be awesome. Fantastic, and congratulations. That is a lot of ground covered. Uh, anybody got anything they want to ask or say about this amazing public badges beta, open badges, public beta? Excellent. Yes, you're getting tons of love and congrats in the IRC on the Etherpad. So very exciting. Um, and I've been really enjoying the Floss Manuals community. For those that don't know, is an open source community dedicated to documenting free software. They're actually having a very animated conversation about integrating the Open Badges stuff into the Floss Manuals platform. So it's been really fun to see that going on and see the curiosity and the excitement about the OBI stuff. All right, let us move forward. Rumor has it that Ignite needs developer feedback. Who is going to tell us about the developer feedback that Ignite might need? 
Catherine and Hey ho. So, so we uh, are really zeroing in on a launch date, which is fantastic. We've been waiting for a long time for this. Um, sounds like it's going to be May 1st, 2nd, or 4th, but it's not over till it's over. And someone asked what we're waiting for, and basically the launch of Ignite as a whole, they're waiting for a White House presence, hopefully the president, and that's one of those things you just never know till the last second whether you're going to get one. So hence the waiting. So um, basically the challenge has four phases, so we're going to be launching just the brainstorm piece when that happens in May. And the part that we're asking for feedback on is actually the developer part of the challenge where developers will be building apps. The question that I pose to our basically target market or who we're trying to attract to this challenge is what do you need to see from Genie, which is the test bed that we're using, um, what questions do you need answered in order to feel like you would want to uh, submit to the challenge and be a part of it. So I'm just trying to sort of reach out to as many different people as possible to get that feedback, like what you need to see from them to understand it and make a decision on whether it's for you or not. And so Catherine, what's, what's Genie for people who are unfamiliar? Basically the, the whole challenge is based on building apps in, in uh, one gigabit per second network, which is program programmable and sliceable. And so since this doesn't exist yet, we need to use this test bed that has been put together to, um, to build this and to build these apps and demo them. So that is what we're trying to piece together is what do we need from them in terms of documentation or like what's, what's the whole package that people would want to see. Ben, maybe you want to chime in on this as well. Okay, Ben's not there right now, I guess. But anyway, um, so I think this is probably a longer conversation than just on the call. So if, if people are willing to give me a little feedback by reviewing what we have, I'd really like it if you could get in touch with me because um, we could use your help. Am I muted? You're there, baby. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, no, I think that's exactly right. Um, there's a kind of modicum of documentation available on the Genie site, and we're putting together kind of a high-level explanation of how it works. Uh, and I think we're just looking for feedback from developers in terms of how we're communicating it, um, you know, what extra documentation we might need, and I, I don't really have much more to add. That was great. Right on. Thank you, Ben. Katrin, uh, any specific uh, invitations on how people can get in touch with you, give you feedback? Do you want folks on uh, a weekly call, or how do you want people to sort of give you any other ideas or continue the conversation? I just put my email there, and we could figure it out over email. All right. A brave person putting their email on a public web page. Thank God it's not Google Reachable. Excellent. Congratulations on moving that forward. I can't wait to see it happen. And for those that have not seen the scorecard, um, each person in the Mozilla community now owes Ross approximately two beers of his choosing the next time you see him based on his phenomenal work on that platform. Okay. Moving forward to the BayVac Open Source class. Speaker? Question mark. Who for art our speaker? Anybody? Anybody? Hey, that is, that is me again. Hey, Bubby. Hey. <laughs> so uh, not a lot to, to really add to that blog post, but it's a really great blog post that just shows uh, what the BayVac people are up to between now and the time that we do our next web made movies, popcorn, summer jam. Um, and it's really nice. They're using processing and um, processing JS and a bunch of cool stuff. And it's all outlined in the blog post there. Thank you, sir. All right. Question to note. Is Bayback participating in the Mozilla summer campaign? Uh, yeah, for sure. We need to work out exactly how, but it's definitely going to happen. Love it. Any other questions about the Bayback open source class before we trundle forward? All right. So um, popcorn youth program update. Jacob, could you tell us a little bit about the name storm challenge? Star seven on mute. Paging Jacob to the front lobby. Jacob, are you in the building? 
Okay. Well, it sounds like Jacob may be hanging out with Liliana. I'm guessing they went out to have a cigarette. Um, you know, one of my favorite geeks on Earth, his name is Cole Gillespie, and he apparently has a call me demo. Um, don't call me demo. Hey, Hello. Twilio plus popcorn. Cole, are you there? Can you guys hear me? Oh, hey, Jacob. Hey. How was that Sorry, cigarette? Yeah. Oh, it's delicious. Uh, Star Seven, Excellent. Star Star Six. Sorry. All right, uh, cool, man. So tell us all about Popcorn Youth Program. Yes, uh, lots of stuff happening with Popcorn Youth Program. We have a lot of youth organizations that love popcorn, and they've been doing a lot of demos and showing a lot of people. Um, we have some speakers confirmed. Um, we have Corey Dr. Nevada is on, and Kat Sizek from High Rise is on. Um, if you guys have ideas for some really cool speakers, uh, let me know. Um, I'll just put take it at Mozilla Foundation .org. Um, and I'm trying to come up with a really good name, and so I'm going to just paste in a short list of some names for this program, and that's the Name Storm Challenge. So if you are ready, on line 303, there's some names I'm trying to come up with um, to sort of uh, give this program a name besides Popcorn Youth. Um, <laughs> Or youth corn. I don't think that one's very good either. Um, cool. Plus a thousand on super current cinema. That was my right field far out name. Um, so yeah, do you, I, I kind of actually want to see what you guys think of some of these names um, because I kind of lock a lock a good name for it. Um, so Ben challenged me to do that in front of all of you. Hey Jacob, what is the popcorn youth program? Ah uh, yes. Pardon me. The popcorn youth program is an initiative um, to scale up from the pilot with Bayvac. Um, which some of you know about, um, where we basically uh, made help, help build Popcorn Maker and worked with youth media centers that have traditionally focused on filmmaking, um, a lot of storytelling and documentary around uh, video and filmmaking. Now we want um, them to augment and expand and learn popcorn and um, get kids excited about web native cinema. And um, so we're introducing the art of popcorn into uh, a swath of youth media organizations, and we're going to basically uh, do an online learning lab this summer, and so we're going to have speakers, and um, we've got big blue buttons set up, so we're going to have uh, four special rooms so people can jam on movie ideas, um, and it's aimed at uh, young people, preferably you know, around 14, uh, 15, 14, 15 to 19 years old, um, and so we're getting um, young people to tell their stories of popcorn and popcorn maker. And we're partnering with youth media organizations and getting their trainers and instructors literate and comfortable and loving popcorn. Very, very cool. Um, just checking the MoPad. Let's see. Um, yeah, and so if you would be kind enough just to go ahead and put a little bit more info in there, that would be awesome, including any link that might be oh, yes. useful to uh, people. Oh, yeah, I do have a wiki page. That cool, that would be awesome. And I apologize that we don't have more time to brainstorm on the uh, brainstorm on the name storm. Is that what I'm supposed to say? But um, invite folks. How can folks get in touch with you? There it is, Jacob at MozillaFoundation.org. And so we will invite folks to give you their thoughts on the name and hope you can give us an update on that next week. So Jacob, thank you so much. This is exciting to see this moving forward. All right. I started to introduce it, and now I'm going to introduce it, Cole Gillespie. Not to be confused with, with Cole Hardware. Hey Cole, what's up man? Do you have a demo for us? Are you there? Star 7 to unmute. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so, so I had some trouble with uh, the public facing side of this demo, so I just decided to put it all on GitHub and uh, anybody can go clone it and run it locally on their machine. If they need any help, they can talk to me and I'll walk them through it. <laughs> but, uh, well, how about I'm that? Do you, do you want to give us a traumatic narrative of what the demo would have showed us? Um, I mean, it's basically it's basically a video that enables uh, at certain any point in the video, whatever you determine, to call uh, a, any given array of numbers. So it's it's kind of a, a silly plug-in, and I don't really see it being used it anywhere. But it was fun to make. Uh, <laughs> it, it came out of it. it came is out that of not the quintessential way. hack? I mean, come on, that's beautiful. Yeah, so Cole, actually, is this basically you're saying that these are like videos that can phone people? Is that basically it? Say that again. Sorry. So you're saying it's basically creating like videos that can phone people. Exactly. Yeah. Or text if you wish. 
Cool. And, and am I correct that the real world use cases are forthcoming? Are we going to we're going to figure out how to use this in, a, for instance, a music video context where rock stars can call their fans? I don't know. Actually, I haven't even thought about how it was used. All I, all I could think was just like, wow, this just seems like a spam nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So building a better spam cannon. That will be the theme of today's yeah. non-demo. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. Any questions about the demo that we may have just not seen? Well, Jeff, Jeff All right. is just uh, wondering about its potential as like an activism tool like for, for things around like the anti-SOPA campaign and that sort of thing. I don't know, Cole, do you see awesome. like a non-spam version of how, how this could be applied? Uh, you know, honestly, I hadn't even thought about how it could be applied. I was hoping that maybe the call would maybe throw some ideas at me, which just happened. Um, People are kind of keen to see it. Do you think the public facing issues like could be worked out for like a future uh, for a future call, so we could kind of yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can work it out with uh, the Nojitsu guys. I just haven't had time on being on the Easter break and everything, I just got it all up on GitHub today. But I'll talk with the Nojitsu guys and get all the server side stuff worked out for a public facing side of this. Love it. Cool. Thank you, Cole. All right. Let us move on down the line. Uh, Matt, it looks like you've got some things to say about the Mozilla All Hands meeting on Monday. Yeah, just super quick. I'll maybe start a thread with a separate thread with folks to kind of throw out the details. But um, yesterday, the Open Badges team uh, did a, a presentation in the All Hands meeting on uh, beta, which we just heard from earlier from, from Aaron. And so what you see in line 395 is um, a proposal for some um, some follow-up uh, Lightning presentations from from this group. Basically, the goal is just to get um, these projects and Mozilla WebMaker news into those Monday Mozilla All Hands meetings just so that we can um, surface them to the, the broader Mozilla community. So um, what I'm kind of proposing there in line 395 is a rough schedule for, um, for future, future lightning presentations. So if, if folks who are on this call um, from those, those various project teams, if you want to provide feedback or suggest alternate dates, Maybe you could just do that um, in, in, in the pad. Um, in particular, I guess the question for Dan Sinker is um, whether you wanted to maybe uh, be the next up and present the Open News uh, Fellowship uh, stuff and new website on uh, this coming Monday on April 16th. Sure, no problem. Cool. Thanks. Well, That's that was easy. Center. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, for those who are thrown off by seismic activity in the Etherpad, I'm warning everyone that I'm about to move the data journalism item downward to the end. Last call for Liliana. Liliana, are you with us? We would sure love to hear about the data journalism handbook, and otherwise we'll move it to next week's call. All right, well, goodness gracious, we are running ahead of schedule. Um, Anything, Matt, you want to point out from the calendar or any other things that we should put on people's radar before we open the floor up to see if there's any other business? Sure. I'm wondering if anybody uh, wants to talk about the Wall Street Journal Data Transparency Weekend happening April 13th to 15th. Well, this is Gunnar. Maybe I should talk about that since I'm helping to run it. Um, so yeah, it's actually a pretty interesting event. Uh, the Wall Street Journal for a while uh, Julia Anglin and Jennifer DeVries have been working on a thing called data transparency that has as sort of a core application, you know, uh, safety for journalists, but it exists at a much larger level around privacy and anonymity. And um, so basically, uh, the weekend ahead is, is a codathon. Uh, they can't call it a hack fest because of certain things that have transpired with the apparent company in recent months in London. But um, it's going to be a codathon, about 100 folks coming. Um, I think perhaps the most important thing personally for me is I got a little Wall Street Journal head cut. If you scroll down, it just made me feel so existentially validated. But um, what we're going to be doing is three – check out that ugly little bastard. Isn't he just the, the deal? <laughs> Yeah, a little larger. Okay, that's good. Right on. Yeah. I feel like they got my better side. But anyway, yeah, so I had lunch with these folks yesterday. I actually sat in the Wall Street Journal newsroom yesterday and did some email. And the woman knew how to freak me out. She's like, Rupert walks by sometimes, so you can keep an eye out for him. I was like, get out. You're kidding me. She's like, no, he's very involved. So he didn't walk by. But it was really fun to watch people doing right-wing journalism in real time. So 
Um, the event this weekend, I asked her when we agreed to work with them, I said, hey, you guys are owned by Murdoch. This scares me a little bit. And they claim to be the insurgent posse within the Wall Street Journal, which is quite exciting. And um, they actually seem to have all the right motivations around really just trying to educate people around privacy and anonymity. And they're hoping in this uh, event this weekend to really get some code moved forward. I know in the um, circumvention track, the focus is on getting some of the Tor mobile tools moved forward. Dan Finker has been kind enough to um, invest some resources from his program to send fine people, like I do believe Cole, you will be joining us, I do hope, this weekend. So there will be some Mozilla action in the house. And the hope is across those three tracks to put forward some more tools that really not only help people circumvent in situations where they need to be anonymous, but also understand why this stuff matters and also detect when they are being surveilled and when they are in fact uh, subject to any kind of Internet uh, blocking or human rights uh, interference. So we shall see what comes of it, but I'm cautiously excited about this crazy scene happening this weekend. Very cool. Um, the only other things I see upcoming in the calendar are Design Jam in Barcelona. Looks like Eventbrite uh, link coming soon. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about MozCamp Latin America in Buenos Aires, April 20th to 22nd. There's a link in the calendar if folks want to learn more there. Um, and it looks like we've got a Popcorn Learning Lab coming up in Berlin. I don't know if Michelle or Brett wants to give us a preview there. Uh, I think Michelle knows more about it, but it is at the same time as our Hot Docs event, uh, which is going to be in Toronto. So um, yeah, it's a group of people that are doing a learning lab with a very similar structure as we did in London. I think Michelle's on vacation, actually. She is. Yep. Yeah. And I think I should overshare on her behalf and just tell everyone that her fine boyfriend proposed on the side of a giant mountain in Japan. So she, she is now engaged. I hope I'm not spoiling any surprises, but she was bubbling when I talked to her earlier. Wow. That's very sweet. And and her fiance works for Mozilla as well, no? Uh, his name is Peter, and I think he's got his own sort of high-tech marketing strategy shop in Berlin. Oh, I, I apologize. It's okay. I mean, not everybody are works we, for Mozilla. Are we allowed to marry outside of Mozilla? Is that a new policy? <laughs> hey, come on. It's an open organization, Matt. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, don't, let's not even extrapolate that metaphor. Cool. That looks like that's it for the calendar. Excellent. Well, hey, it is five minutes before the hour, and in an opportunistic time grab, I am going to propose that we wrap up early. I want to thank all of the fantastic people that shared updates on this call. We will look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same place, for the weekly Mozilla WebMaker call. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, Gunnar. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.